thank you for your giving and let us uh, enter into singing as Brother Kenny comes to lead us in the singing this morning. Let's uh, make a joyful noise into the Lord. Good morning. You ready for some good news? Would you like to hear some good news? I mean, really good news. Page 694. Page 694. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. The tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land. Climb the steps and cross the waves. Onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. It on the rolling tide, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, tell to sinners far and wide, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing ye islands of the sea, echo back ye ocean pain, her shall keep her to Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing above the battle strife, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. By his death and endless life, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing its song. Now rejoice, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, shout salvation full and free, highest hills and deepest cave, this our song of victory, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Amen. Are you glad for that? Yeah, Song number 361. Since Jesus saves, we can be a child of the King. Song number 361. Oh. 
Thank the Lord. It's good to be a part of the family of God, isn't it? And uh, as we were, as you were singing that, and I was thinking on the words, I thought of that one phrase in there where it says, "I've been adopted." Now, whether you realize it or not, that is a pretty special, significant fact. Why I recall when a couple of Boys were kind of arguing, and one of them was making fun of the other one because he was adopted, and uh, the one that was making fun of him had not, of course, been adopted, and he was trying to make light of the other guy because he was adopted. And that fellow took all he could take, and finally he says, well, I tell you what, he said, I'm way better off than you are. He said, when you were born, your parents had to take what they got. He said, my parents chose me. And uh, you know what? God chose us. I've been adopted. My name's written down. He chose me. He didn't just have to take what he got. He chose me, and thank God for that. Well, we want to prepare our hearts for prayer this morning, and as we do, um, I want to, we've been praying for two or three different ones with serious concerns for quite a while. We've been praying for Anita Faust and be daughter-in-law of uh, Danny and Ruth Ann, and uh, she has had a very difficult time and uh, continues to be uh, down at Indianapolis. Is that at Methodist? Methodist Hospital at Indianapolis, and uh, she now has bacterial pneumonia after being through so much for the last month, and uh, they had to put a tr do a tracheotomy on her this past week. That was successful, but she had been even struggling to come out from under sedation. And uh, so it's just been a very difficult time for that family. So let's keep Anita Faust in our prayers and also their son-in-law, David Hayes. He had surgery just uh, this past Thursday to remove. He had cancer in his voice box, and they completely removed that. And he has been having a little trouble with some infection fevers over the last uh, 36 to uh, 36 hours or so. So let's just let's keep praying for both of these. They're in very serious need of our prayers, Anita Faust and David Hayes. And uh, then we've been praying for Bill Ames, our dear friend and brother who has been through so much. And uh, after having broken a leg and had surgery to repair it and then contracting COVID and being in isolation and getting over that, now his leg became infected, and uh, I know he went into surgery this morning at 7.30. I don't know if you have any reports on that. It was emergency surgery. They might 
have had to completely redo the, the previous surgery of about a month ago. And uh, even talked about having to remove the hardware that they put in there. And I, he'd show me the x-rays of all, them, all those screws in there. And uh, I've met a few people I thought had two or three loose screws, but his were tight. But uh, anyway, let's pray for, uh, pray for Brother Bill Ames. He has been so anxious to get back to church. And uh, here he is um, facing a new crisis again. And so let's, uh, let's pray for him. Also continuing to pray for Andy Brown. Do you have an update on him this morning, Pam? Yeah, no, she's doing quite a bit better the last few days. Good, good. She's coming out of Good. Well, we're anxious to see him again. And so let's just continue to pray for Andy Brown. And then uh, one other physical need. Well, two other physical needs I want to mention. One would be Ruth McCormick, our dear sister, who continues to be at home on oxygen, let's pray for her, and also Jim and Lafina are still not doing well physically, and talked with him on the phone last night, and they're needing our prayers, so let's continue to pray for them, and I guess I should mention another, let's pray for Brother Charlie, uh, he uh, contracted COVID over a week ago, and uh, his parents, but they're all doing better, but he told me last night they just kind of have a lingering cough. And so let's just uh, lift them in our prayers. God cares about all of these needs. I also um, want you to uh, pray for our nation. Our nation really needs our prayers. We continue to go through many uh, times of what I would call crisis in many respects. There's a lot of uncertainties happening over in uh, Ukraine and Russia and um, we just need, we need to pray for one another. We have friends over in Ukraine, in fact, had communication uh, from uh, one of them uh, this past week. They uh, are missionaries over there. They, they have a good, sizable group of people that they minister to. And he said, you know, we're not trying to be presumptuous, but he said, we're not afraid. At this point, we feel like we're supposed to stay put. He says, these are our people. We've been here for many years, and we're not leaving. He said, I'm not going to say we never will. If God makes it very clear that we should, we will. But uh, he said, we're not unwilling. But he said, we don't feel afraid. We feel like we need to stay right where we are. So um, let's pray. Their names are Scott and Roxana. And God knows their family. They have a beautiful family. And so let's pray for them that God will be with them. I'm sure some of you have some unspoken requests. You just like to lift your hand. God cares about every one of those many hands going up across the congregation. I'm going to invite you to stand with me as we look to the Lord in prayer today. And as you hear me say often, you feel free to talk to the Lord while I talk to the Lord. He has a multi, multi, multi-track mind. And he can hear all of us talking to him simultaneously. And he loves to hear his people pray. And so let's, uh, let's talk to him together this morning. Thank you so much, dear Lord, for the great opportunity that we have to come into your house. Thank you that we have the ability to gather together as we are. Thank you for the freedom of worship. Thank you that we are able to come here and uh, focus upon you and, and sing about you, praise you, study your word and learn from your word. And uh, Lord, we just thank you for all of these blessings and as we continue forward in this service today, we just pray that you would guide and direct in every aspect in the special singing that is yet to come. And as we endeavor to look into your word for a while later on, I just pray that you would enlighten our minds and our hearts together. And Lord, our hearts are burdened and concerned for several from among us that have physical needs. We continue to pray for Anita Faust and David Hayes as they are going through some very difficult and cr critical times right now. I pray that you would help Anita to come out of the effects of this bacterial pneumonia and uh, also David Hayes that he would recuperate and recover from the cancer surgery that he faced this past Thursday. Lord, give them a calmness. Give them a peace. May they understand and recognize that in the midst of these times of crisis that you are there to walk with us and may they recognize the effects of uh, many people that are praying in their behalf. 
We pray also for Brother Bill Ames today, whom we miss and wish he could be here with us as he has been looking forward to returning as soon as possible. And now it seems that he's back to square one as far as his, his leg is concerned. Lord, I pray that you would give wisdom to the surgeon and his team as they are working on him, perhaps still in surgery right now. We don't know how long the surgery was supposed to last, but Lord, uh, I just pray that you would guide the surgeon's hand, and we thank you for Brother Bill's faith and his focus on you and his good attitude, and thank you, Lord, for how he continues to, to look to you and praise you in the midst of difficulty, but Lord, we are burdened for him and concerned for him, and I just pray that you would help him in a very special way right now, and then, Lord, we continue to lift Ruth McCormick, our sister, up to you and pray that you would be near to her, help her, as we know that her desire uh, is to be here with us and yet she is not able to at this present time. I just pray that you would continue to give her uh, help and strength and even patience in the midst of what she is going through. But uh, we thank you also for her her demeanor and for her focus and that she continues to praise you even in the midst of what she is facing there at home. I pray also for Jim and Levina. We miss them from our midst and pray that you would be with them and help them to experience your healing touch. We thank you, Brother Charlie, as well, Lord. We miss him today and missed the fact of him being able to be here last Sunday and we just pray that you would continue to give him your healing touch and your help to his parents as well and uh, just continue to guide in that uh, situation. We lift him up to you, Lord. And then, Lord, we certainly do pray for our dear friends in Ukraine and, and we know that there are many, many others that we aren't personally acquainted with, but people that love you and people that walk with you and I know, Lord, that you have promised to be with us through, it, through whatever we faced, and we know that they will be no exception. But we want to do our part to lift them in prayer and ask that you would be with them and strengthen them and help them continue to give uh, encouragement to Scott and Roxanna, Lord. May they feel your uh, surrounding presence and help. I just pray, Lord, that you would be near uh, during these very difficult times. We pray for our nation as a whole, Lord. We know that we are living in difficult times, and yet they are never too difficult for you. In the midst of uncertainties, in the midst of heartaches, in the midst of uh, times of uh, crisis, yet you continue to be ultimately in control. We continue to look to you in faith and confidence, knowing that you are never taken by surprise, even though we often are. We thank you, Lord, that we can look to you and we can rest in you, that we do not have to be overcome with uh, an unreasonable anxiety or paranoia, but we can continue to truly rest in you and trust in you and know that you have everything under control. Lord, I thank you for every person that is here with us today. You have brought us together. We do not believe that any of us are here by accident. You have brought us together as we are for a purpose, and I thank you for every person that is here, and I pray that you would just continue to uh, help us each one, Lord, to receive from you that that you have for us. We believe that you have a plan for every one of us today and you have something for each of us. I pray for those that will be ministering to us in song here in just a little while and anoint them and bless their ministry and, and a little later as we look into your word, we just pray for your enlightenment and your inspiration. Thank you, Lord, for many that are with us today that have not been feeling well in the last two weeks that are much better and have uh, uh, been touched and healed, and we thank you for that. And we just continue to look towards you for all that you have for us. You saw every hand that was lifted for prayer today, and you know what each one represents. And we bring all of these needs to you. In your precious name, the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And everybody said, Amen. You may be seated, and at this time we have a special number and song by a trio of, I think they're young men. So uh, let's have those young men come and minister to us today.
Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Jesus, lover of my soul. Friends may fail me, foes assail me. He, my Savior, makes me Jesus, what a strength in weakness. Let me hide myself in Him. Tempted, tried, and sometimes failing, He my strength, my victory wins. Hallelujah, what a Savior, hallelujah, what a friend, saving, helping, keeping, loving, He is with me too. Jesus, I do now receive him more than all in him I find. He hath granted me forgiveness. I am his and of what they were singing about. Praise the Lord. What a joy to be in His presence this morning. Praise God. Well, at this time, I'm going to dismiss the children that so desire to go to their time of Bible study, ages 12 and under, if they so desire to. And I'm going to invite the rest of you to turn with me to an Old Testament passage. We're looking over to Exodus chapter... 31, actually beginning with the last verse of chapter 31, and then moving into chapter 32, just a little bit lengthy scripture reading today, but I want to uh, make sure that uh, if you're not familiar with the story, you get some of the details from the scriptures of this story, and so we're going to read verses 1 through 19 of chapter 32. So um, again, that's Exodus 31, beginning with verse 18, the last verse of chapter 31, and then reading through uh, chapter 32, verses 1 through 19. 
All right, if you're physically able, feel free to stand with me. If you are not able or don't desire to, that's all right. You can remain seated, but I like to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word, and I just appreciate His Word. That's our foundation. Beginning with verse 18 of Exodus chapter 31, speaking of God, it says, He gave unto Moses... When he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, or another word we might use would be a tablet. Uh, We think of a tablet as something you write on. Well, God wrote on this, but they're referred to here as tables of stone. And I want you to notice this, written with the finger of God. That's significant. We read on. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons and your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. So he takes all this gold, melts it, and makes a calf, that that would appear to be like a calf, out of gold. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, He built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation. Remember who Aaron is. That's Moses' brother. And he said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said unto Moses, Remember Moses is up in the mountain. And he says, Go, get thee down, for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way, which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf. They have worshipped it. They have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone. This is God still speaking to Moses. He says, Let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them and that I may consume them. And I will make of thee, of you, Moses, a great nation. Verse 11 is an amazing verse of Moses interceding. Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against Thy people. It's interesting that in uh, verse 8, God referred to them as His people, as Moses' people, and then Moses turned around and referred to them as God's people. And uh, He said, uh, Your people, which you have brought forth out of the land of Egypt, and with great power and with a mighty hand, wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did He, God, bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath. Repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham and Isaac and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and said unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. That's an amazing verse. Here's a sovereign God who changed his mind through the intercession of his servant. Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand, the tables written on both their sides. Remember we read earlier they were written by the finger of God. On the one side and on the other side were they written, and the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. And Moses said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. 
And it came to pass as soon as he, Moses, came nigh into the camp and he saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger waxed hot and he cast the tables out of his hands and broke them beneath the mount. Now this is a very interesting scripture lesson. And for a little while this morning, I want to talk to you about the man of God under pressure. Here's a picture of a person that we would hold in high esteem. We see him as a man that had tremendous power and intercession, but we see him as a human individual as well under pressure. Let's see what we might can find out of this to help us in our daily lives today. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that we have the access to your word. And I pray that as we study for a little while today, uh, that you would just enlighten our minds. Thank you for the beautiful, special song that we have just uh, so wonderfully been inspired by. And thank you, Lord, for all that we have been able to enjoy already in our time of worship. And now I just pray that you would open your word unto us. It would be beneficial to us. In your precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As we study this this morning, I want to, before I even get started, say that I in no way in anything I have to say today want to justify or excuse any wrongdoing in any way, in attitude, in conduct, demeanor, or anything along that line. But within this scripture lesson today, we definitely have a picture of of the man of God, a man by the name of Moses. All of us are very familiar with that name. We've, if you've uh, come to Sunday school, even as a child, you've heard about Moses and learned about Moses. And here we have a picture of Moses under severe pressure. And we see him reacting in a way that is not necessarily what we would consider ideal or maybe even altogether appropriate but we can see an example of a man of God under pressure. The fact is we cannot deny even in our own lives that there are times the circumstances come into our lives that we do not have any control over. We do not have control of the fact that they come into our lives, nor do we have control over what to do to change those circumstances. In many cases, there are times that these types of circumstances that come into our lives can strain, as it were, every fiber of our internal fortitude to the breaking point, if possible. But as we look at this today, I want to give you just a bit of the history, uh, reminding you. We would remember that uh, up to this point, Israel as a nation has had handed down to them their history by word of mouth. Up to this point, they have no written word. We are very blessed to have this, God's Word, the Bible. We are blessed. Whether you have it with you this morning in the form of an electronic device, that's all right. As long as you don't uh, stop to check out all the commercials and the ads that come along while you're reading the Scripture. But uh, that's one thing I like about the Bible. I don't get interrupted or, or distracted by anything else, even a text message coming through while I'm reading the Bible. But I'm not condemning using an electronic device at all. Just simply saying this is my preference, but... The bottom line is we are blessed. We are blessed to have access to God's written word. At this point in the history of Israel as a nation, they did not have that. As a matter of fact, we owe a lot even to Moses. Of course, directly Almighty God, but God used Moses to write the first five books of the Bible. Going clear back to the beginning of time, you say, well, Moses wasn't born yet. No, he wasn't, but God revealed Everything that we have in the book of Genesis, God revealed that to Moses. That's amazing. And then we come to the book of Exodus where we are reading from today. And uh, it's interesting how, and I'm sure some of it was shared even through Moses' mother. That's an amazing story in itself. And we're not going to go there today. 
but uh, I'm sure that even Moses' mother shared with him a lot of the history of his own life up to the point when he became old enough to write down what we have for us. But the fact is, God's intent and God's plan was to provide for His people something, and we use this term, etched in stone. We use that term even today, don't we? But in this case, it was literal. It was absolutely literal. God was providing at this point, all we're having at this point from God to man as far as something written is literally etched in stone and it was what we refer to as the Ten Commandments. Moses has been up in the mountain. He's been on a 40-day fast. We would recognize that... uh, God has been speaking to him and God has been communing with him. The fact is God wants to commune with all of us. God wants to talk with all of us. And God wants us to talk to him. Moses was communing with God. And uh, as we consider the time period in history where this nation was, the time was ripe. The time was needed for some things to be etched down in stone. For you see, as more and more generations pass, stories that can be handed down can become uh, a little bit vague. I have shared with my my children stories of their grandfather whom they never knew, they never met. And I have shared with them stories of their great-grandfather. And, uh, you know, I can do that because I experienced communication with them, but the stories that I share with them about my great-great-grandfather, I have to tell based on what my great-grandfather or my grandfather shared with me. And you see, as you move in generations, it can get vaguer and vaguer and vaguer, and finally, some people never know anything about their ancestry if there's no record kept. But it was important to God that the nation of Israel have a written record. And the time was ripe. It was time to begin to etch some things in stone. And as they were moving towards Canaan, that was a place God was leading them to. Remember, they had been in Egypt uh, for 400 years. And God had actually led them to Egypt through Jacob and his 12 sons at that time. But it was time now to get back to the land of Canaan 400 years later. And God is preparing to establish, and this is important for us to keep in mind as the back set of our story today, God is preparing at that time period in history, we're looking at approximately 1500 B.C., that God was preparing to establish a set of rules. Oh, that's a dirty word, isn't it? Rules? Well, you know what? It's actually a good word. Can you imagine what life would be with no rules? Can you imagine what it would be like uh, just in the sense of driving on an interstate if there were no rules? Well, I don't like driving on this side. I want to drive on that side of the median. Well, you're welcome to, but you know what will happen if you do. You're going to get smashed up. Everybody's going a different direction because the rule says if you're... On this side, you go this direction. You're on that side, you go the other direction. Well, now you can go to Great Britain and you can do it different over there, but you'll get in trouble if you try to change the rules over there and do it like the rules are here. Rules are actually for your safety, for your good. That's just one example. There are many. And you know, God has rules. God laid out rules. And the foundation of those is found in the Ten Commandments and every one of them are still significant today some 3,500 years later. Wow! God was giving them to Moses but it was to, it was to be something that went way beyond the life of Moses. God was preparing to establish a people with a set of laws think about this that would bring a Savior into the world. That was God's intent. In a sense, the Ten Commandments were the foundation for you and I being able to 
today experience the redemption power of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's an amazing thought. I mean, just think about it. We're so quick to want to push off rules or the commandments as irrelevant or outdated, and yet God laid them down as the beginning foundation for providing a Redeemer to this world. As we look at this thought today and what led up to, what brought Moses up to what we read in verse 19 where we see a man of God under pressure that reacted in a way that wasn't altogether, well, it wasn't altogether inappropriate, but it wasn't altogether appropriate either. We're going to look at that a little more in detail. But what was it that led up to that? And I think we could notice it in three different areas that I want to give you very quickly I believe the first thing that led up to what happened in verse 19 was a lack of appreciation of Moses' fervor. Moses had an amazing fervor for God. Moses had an amazing desire to be in the presence of God. Again, you can go back in his history and find that you know, at the time he was born into life that there was a nation in crisis and there was a plan on the part of the administration of the, of the nation of Egypt to kill all the baby boys. We haven't quite come to that. They just don't determine which gender matters. They just kill them all. If there's a choice uh, on the part of a parent through abortion, and we have, been, uh, we have been over the last two Sundays celebrating sanctity of life. And by the way, I'll just pause and say, if you want to be a part of giving to the Randolph County Pregnancy Care Center. There's some more baby bottles back there. And uh, we do this every year just to fill them up uh, with pennies, quarters, dimes, dollar bills, checks, whatever you want to put in them. It doesn't even run through the church treasury. It goes straight to the Pregnancy Care Center at Winchester. And if you haven't taken one and would desire to, do so and just make sure you bring it back in the next couple of weeks with something in it. Besides milk, okay? But uh, coming back to our story, we could see that there is a lack of appreciation for who Moses is. Not that we are endeavoring to raise Moses up to a pedestal, and yet he is a man of fervor. There was an intent on the part of the administration in Egypt to destroy him. His mother had courage. She refused to let that happen. She made, I believe God clearly directed her, but she made a little, a little basket and she put uh, waterproofing on the inside and the outside, made a little lid, and we could call it a little bassinet, uh, and stuck it out there in the Nile River. But she put it up close to the edge where it wouldn't wash on down the river around some bulrushes there and she put his older sister there with eyes to watch and God took care of little Moses and God had a plan for him and God saved his life when the intent of the leaders of his nation was to destroy him because God had a plan and now God is bringing that plan to fruition and it seems that the people that Moses has literally sacrificed his life for. I mean, you study through the early part of the book of Exodus, and I know many of you have, but you find what Moses went through to get these people delivered from Egypt, and now they have a lack of appreciation for who he is and his fervor for God. The King James Version, as we read from this morning, uses the terminology as these people are referring to Moses. They said, we want not what has become of this Moses. I mean, you just, you almost see a feeling, an attitude of uh, just, you know, no appreciation at all. The thought, what not, those are not uh, terms that we are familiar with. But very simply, they're just saying, we have no clue what happened to him. We have no idea where he is, this Moses that brought us up out of Egypt. There's almost like a disdain in their words. And this is the guy that has laid his life on the line for them. He has interceded for them. They have no idea what's going on in the mount right then. And they're like, well, we don't, we don't know what's become of this Moses. We, would you, uh, Aaron, would you make us some gods that we can worship? Can you imagine a lack of appreciation for Moses' fervor? Here he is on a 40-day fast. He's not even eaten out of concern for them, out of desire to lead them, 
out of a fervor to be close to God, not just for his own personal benefit. You can clearly see in his intercession of verse 11, chapter 32, that we read that, I mean, it's not about him, it's about them. And here they have no appreciation for him. The second thing that I feel like influenced what we see occurring in verse 19 was a lack of courage on the part of the man left in charge. I want you to think about this for a moment. This is Aaron. This is Moses' older brother. There was a time, as you may recall, that Moses, who seems to have had some type of a speech impediment, cried out to the Lord and said, Let, Moses, or let Aaron take the lead here, Lord. Let him take the lead. In fact, he asked God early on when they were still in Egypt to let Aaron be his spokesman. Let him do the talking. I, I have a problem talking, Lord. I've got a speech impediment, and I'm, I just can't put uh, you know, words to, together in a way that makes any sense. Lord, use Aaron. You know, God knows who he wants to use. And it's not all about the polished individual. Aaron may have been a man with a polished tongue, but he had a backbone like a jellyfish. He had a backbone like a jellyfish. He had no courage. Here's Moses up there in the mountain in the presence of God, communing with God, interceding for these people. And he leaves his brother in charge, his older brother, that went with him into the office of Pharaoh and went with him through all of the crises, events that they faced during their final weeks in Egypt, saw all of what God was doing, knew a lot about God's laws and plans, though they hadn't been written down yet. And here Aaron becomes a part of the plan to defy God. We're talking about what led up to verse 19. It was the lack of appreciation, the lack of courage by the man left in charge. And I would notice as we move forward in this thought today, what led up to verse 19? It was a lack of restraint on the part of Moses himself. As I said at the very beginning, I'm in no way condoning or excusing wrong behavior, but it helps us to understand what was going on, doesn't it? When you see the lack of appreciation for his fervor, people that could so easily just kind of slough off all that Moses had done for them, just so quickly ready to move on and just not even have any remembrance of him or anything he taught them about God and so quickly just throw away that which mattered. You know, it's amazing that we live in a culture that is wanting to so quickly throw away the principles of God's Word. They want to so quickly teach that, well, if you want to read that, that's okay, but it's really a book of, uh, uh, you know, that's outdated in it, and it teaches people how to be bigots. It's all about bigotry. How quickly can a culture throw away that which matters? That's what was happening here. This is what is leading up to what happened in verse 19. And ultimately, because of their lack of their appreciation and the lack of courage on the part of Aaron, now there comes a lack of restraint on the part of Moses. He took the only thing that he had literally in stone from God and he broke it. He threw it on the ground. He got mad and he threw it on the ground. Have you ever got mad? I have. But before we so quickly condemn his anger... I want us to look at this for a little while because I'm going to take you over to a New Testament passage in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 26 and 27 it may come as a surprise that God's Word says this about anger there in Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 26 and 27. Here's what we read from the writings of the Apostle Paul. 
He says, be ye angry. What? Did I read that right? Be ye angry and sin not. But he adds a phrase. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let's look at this for a little while. Here we see Moses under pressure. We see him angry. He takes the only thing that he has from God etched in stone, throws it on the ground and breaks it. And by the way, that was the last thing he got from God in that form. You will find that later, when he went back to God, he had to, the term from the King James Version is hew out the stone or he had to uh, fabricate it, take it out of stone and literally chisel in it. It became the work of a man's hand. What he had originally was the work of God's hand and the writing with God's finger. Can you imagine if that had been preserved and kept to this day, how amazing that would be? And it would have, if it hadn't been broken, it could have lasted till this day. It was literally etched in stone. And he took the only thing that he had from the finger of God and under pressure he throws that down and breaks it. But before we're so quick to condemn Moses for getting angry, let me remind you who was angry first in this reading. God. In fact, God referred to his own wrath as that which was going to wax hot. Again, that's King James Version terminology that uh, just means that God was very, very angry. And I want to remind you today that we, every one of us, were created in the image of God. We were created in the image of God. What does that mean? God has a lot of different characteristics and we as individuals, human individuals created in the image of God have many of those same characteristics. Intellect is one of them. You may call that into question at times, but uh, as a matter of fact, we were all given intellect. We have the privilege of choice. We have the privilege of having a will to determine why I would assume most of you, if not all of you today, with the exception of the little babies, uh, made a choice of what you were going to wear today. That intellect is a part of the image of God in you. And the fact is that another aspect of the image of God that we have created within us is emotion. Yes, God is a God of emotion. And we as individuals are individuals of emotion. We have emotions. Our emotions can change. And many times they do change directly as a result of circumstances around us. Some of which we have no control over. Either to come or to leave. But we have emotions that rise and fall. I would remind you that mercy is an emotion. I would remind you that love is is an emotion. I would remind you that compassion is an emotion. I would remind you that passion is also an emotion. But I would further add that anger is an emotion. God possesses all of those things that I just made reference to. Because God is a God of emotion. We are created in the image of God. But I would also add, and the scripture is very clear to teach, that while God is a God of emotion, He is also a God of holiness. God is a holy God. One of the earliest commands that came forth from God to His people is, Be ye holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. The fact is, all of the various characteristics of God are governed by His holiness. Do you want to know why it is important for us, as you hear me teach from time to time from the Word of God, for us to have our hearts cleansed, for us to have our hearts purified, for us to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Do you know why that's important? Because as a holy God... 
is holy and His holiness governs all of His characteristics, including His emotions. So we need to be holy. We are not born holy. No, we're not born that way. While we are created in the image of God, and that's another whole story in itself, we do not receive holiness at birth just because of being in the image of God. It is something that because of the fall in the Garden of Eden that we have to wrestle with up to a point to where we come to the recognition that God has a plan to cleanse that from our lives and to fill us with the presence of His Holy Spirit. So why is it important for us to be made holy? To govern our emotions. To govern our reactions. God's emotions are governed by His holiness. Specifically, let me add, God's anger is governed by His holiness. God is never angry without a cause. Again, I remind you, God was the first one who got angry in this chapter. And it was not without cause, was it? We read it in verse 10. God was very angry. God was ready to wipe out these people. God said enough is enough. And God does come to that point at times. You see, as we read in Ephesians, it says, Be ye angry and sin not, but let not the sun go down upon your wrath. How do we determine when anger is appropriate and when anger is not? And I would uh, say to you, it depends on what you do with your anger. It depends on what you do with your anger. And anger that drives you to murder is an unholy anger. An anger that drives you to bitterness is an unholy anger. An anger that causes you to carry a grudge against somebody that hurt you for many, many years. You carry that grudge. That's an unholy anger. I bring you back to the verse that says, Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. In other words, don't harbor it. There are times that anger is very appropriate in the face of wickedness and in the face of sin and in the face of something that has been done is totally, absolutely wrong. There is a basis for anger, but what do you do with it? To harbor it is wrong. To harbor it can create within you destruction and anger that motivates you to purposely harm someone else is an un holy anger. I say again, that is why it is so important to have a holy heart. As God's anger is governed by His holiness, so His people need a holy heart to govern their emotions. I will say to you very transparently that as a husband and as a father, I have a very natural response to protect my family. Thankfully, I've never experienced someone breaking into my home. I hope that I never do. I cannot tell you exactly what I would do since I have never experienced it. But I assure you, I would be angry. And I assure you, there would be some sort of reaction. You may not uh, believe it, but I would probably be a lot like the old Quaker that stood uh, with an individual breaking into his home, stood with a shotgun aimed right at that man and said as kindly, as calmly as he could, I do not wish to do thee any harm, but thou art standing right where I am about to shoot. (laughs) Now that's about how I would be. Might not use that terminology. I might not even give him that much warning. But uh, that is a natural emotion in response to a circumstance that is beyond my control. It would be inappropriate for me to not be angry about that. Say, well, just come on in, buddy, you know, help yourself. No, it's appropriate to be angry under those kinds of circumstances. God has given us emotion. The idea that a person that is truly holy never gets his feathers ruffled is a non-biblical concept. Now, you don't have to say amen. You can say ouch. That'll be all right. But it is a fact. There are times that we do need to respond to an appropriate anger and see that something is done about something that is wrong. To say that a person that is holy can never get angry is to raise a standard above even what God 
displays, I would remind you. But I come back to our point, what we do with that anger is what matters. The holy heart can rise in an appropriate righteous anger against sin and against iniquity. Again, I would point out to you and notice that Moses' anger was not motivated by selfish or self-centered reasons, was it? It had nothing to do with him. He was angry because these people were turning their backs on God. I mean, I'm just kind of reading between the lines, but I understand that reaction. I understand that emotion. It's like, you've got to be kidding me. Look what God has done for you. God brought you out of Egypt. God, through a series of ten plagues, proved even to Pharaoh, the leader of the administration of the nation of Israel at that time, God proved to him who he was and proved to him that he was going to have the final say. I mean, you saw all of these things that God did. And even at times during those plagues, things would happen in the mainland of Egypt that would not happen in the land of Goshen where the nation of Israel was. God was protecting them even then. And you mean to tell me? You've got to be kidding me. You mean to tell me you are going to go back to some of the false religions of Egypt? You know, a part of the religion of Egypt, they worshipped uh, that which was not the true and the living God. Many times animals. And here they are worshiping a cow. Specifically mentioned as a calf. Made out of gold. No wonder Moses was angry. you got to be kidding me. After all that God has done for you. But you know I would say to us as United States citizens. How could we as a nation. Turn our back on the principles of God's Word when that is what has made us into the great nation that we are? I understand Moses' anger. Why, I get angry at times in our nation today when I sense and I see and I recognize that basic principles such as Sanctity of marriage between a man and a woman. Such as sanctity of life of an unborn child. Such as sanctity of biological gender. That is God's design is called into question. And as recent as this last week, as Brother Dave shared in Sunday school on the front page of the Portland paper, a major discussion over The fact that anybody that would be opposed to a person born biologically as a male being involved in sports on a women's team or a woman's team, ladies' team, anybody that would call that into question is nothing but a religious bigot. On the front page of, no, not the New York Times, the Portland paper this week. That makes me angry. Because it's in total contradiction to God's Word. And I would add common sense too. But we'll move on from there. But what do you do with your anger? You see there was a time period during the time that slavery was legal in the United States of America. Something that I'm thankful our forefathers of this church were very much a part of the abolitionist movement and did everything they could We see even examples of that as near as Fountain City with the Levi Coffin House. They were part of the same group that our heritage comes from. I'm thankful that we had those of our forefathers that stood against that. But there were some at that time that stood against slavery that went around killing other people. That's not the right way to deal with it. Just like we very much support and believe in sanctity of life, but I have known of some that have taken that anger and allowed it to inappropriately cause them to murder a doctor that was involved in an abortion. That's not right either. Two wrongs don't make a right. We understand anger. And God's Word says anger in its place is actually a part of being in the image of God. But what do you do with that anger? I want to 
I want to point out again that Moses' anger was not the result of a self-centered focus. It was just the opposite. If it would have been self-centered, he would have jumped at God's offer. Did you notice God's offer? Did you catch that? When God was angry, he said, Get out of my way, Moses. Let me destroy these people, and I will make out of you, Moses, a great nation. If this would have been all about Moses, he'd have said, You know what, God? That's a pretty good idea. I like that idea. Make out of me, Moses, a great nation. Well, yeah, I believe that, you know, my genetics would be just what you need to make a great nation, right? But it wasn't about Moses, was it? It was about God's law. It was about God's instructions that he was handing down. And when God made that offer to Moses, when he said, get out of my way, let me destroy this people, and I'll raise out of you a great nation and still keep my promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Moses said, no, 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 God. What kind of a testimony is this, this going to give to the Egyptians? Well, you just spent all this time, Lord, proving to the Egyptians that you were the almighty, powerful God. And if you wipe them out, they're going to say, well, their God, he might have been powerful, but he sure couldn't take care of them when they got into the moments of crisis. He said, Lord, it's going to destroy your name. And as we read to you, it's an amazing verse in the Bible where it says, and the Lord repented. I'm not sure I can fully explain that, but I believe it because God's Word teaches it. But the fact is, here is an example of a God, a sovereign God who was angry, and His holy man that got angry. And yet through intercession, Moses changed God's mind. Again, I say I'm not sure I can explain that, but I believe it because the Word teaches it. But as we draw to conclusion today, I want us to look at what I believe are two distinguishing factors on how we should deal with anger. We see the Bible teaches that anger in itself is not sin, but it's what you do with anger. A person that does not appropriately express anger or show anger in a time when they should, such as a father that I gave you example earlier, would be an example of someone that does not have the fortitude that they should have in the, in the midst of a crisis. But what do you do with that anger? First thing I think that we need to consider is what motivates the anger. What motivates it? A temper tantrum? No basis for that in a holy person. If it's motivated by me first... If it's motivated by, I'm going to have my way no matter what. You're stepping on my toes. Get out of my way. I'm going to have my way no matter what. That's a wrong anger. There's no basis for that. What motivates it? Again, I remind you in the case of Moses, it was motivated based on a people that God had done so much for that were turning their backs on God. There was a cause for that anger. He had a basis for that anger. What motivates the anger? The second distinguishing factor that we should consider is what do you do with that anger? And here's where Moses went wrong, I believe. His anger was not wrong. The reason for his anger was not wrong. The motivation for his anger was not wrong. But what he did with that anger was what was wrong. And that is what we need to consider. I remind you again of the scripture that says, Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. It is clearly teaching that we are not to harbor anger. Anger that is harbored will turn into bitterness. Anger that is harbored... I have known of people that have harbored anger and carried a grudge against people for years. And one of the displays or one of the, uh, the characteristics of somebody like that is they can tell you 20 years later after an event occurred in detail what happened. I might have been there and I'm like, did that happen? I mean, when you dwell on it, when you harbor it, 
and you can tell in detail how somebody wronged you 20 years later, you're not handling that anger right. That's wrong. You're harboring a grudge. That's going to destroy you. They may have wronged you. They may have. I've been wrong before. Probably all of us have been. But what do you do with that anger? Do you harbor it? He said, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Moses was justified in his anger, but his lack of restraint caused him to lose something he never, ever regained. Wow. And I believe there are times if we're not careful, we can do the same. Moses had in his hands the work of God's hands. He had in his hands that which God had inscribed with his finger. We can look around in a beautiful world that God has created and we can see his handiwork. The trees, the grass. The beautiful plants that grow, flowers. We can go on and on and on and on. We can look at God's handiwork, but there's not one of us that can hold in our hands something like Moses had in his hands. The literal artwork of God that was etched in stone. Wow. His lack of restraint caused him to lose that, and he never regained it. God didn't say, oh, by the way, Moses, come back up in the mountain and I'll make you another set. Never happened. Never happened. Now, I believe God understood Moses' wrath, but we recognize also that Moses had to deal with the consequences of his lack of restraint in that moment of anger. Those tablets of stone that were provided the first time by God, Moses had to chisel and sculpt out the second set. As we come to conclusion this morning, I would remind you of what we have learned today. We recognize that we, as human individuals, are created in the image of God. And God, being a God of emotion, is very natural and appropriate for us to be people of emotion we recognize that anger is an emotion and that God, as a God of emotion, does at times display anger. And it is therefore natural and appropriate for us at times to display anger. But the significant factors that we must keep in our mind as to determine the appropriateness of anger is what motivates it and what do you do with it. After you experience it. I believe God can help us to come to understanding and even be a recipient of that which He provides through the cleansing power of His Holy Spirit, not to remove anger from our lives when it is appropriate for it to be exercised, but rather with a holy heart to know how to deal with or what to do with anger when it appropriately comes. Moses was a man of God, but yet in his anger, his lack of restraint caused him to lose something that he never regained. May that not be the case in our lives. I invite you to stand with me for our closing prayer today. Thank you for being a very attentive congregation and before we pray I would just uh, add a couple quick announcements uh, number one remember that tonight is fifth Sunday meeting and uh, that occurs different places throughout the year sometimes here but tonight fifth Sunday meeting will be hosted by the Wesleyan Holiness Church in Winchester that's right on the north end of Winchester most of you know where that is and that service starts at 6 o'clock tonight, like ours normally does. But we will not be here tonight. We will be there tonight for Fifth Sunday meeting. The other announcement, um, you may notice that all of the poinsettias have been taken out of the decor. And it's had added to it a wintry look versus Christmas look. And I like the wintry look, don't you? 
I like that new look that's up there today. And you might notice all the signs that are there, the fruits of the Spirit. But we do have some poinsettias at the exit today. If you want one, take it. They have been watered up to this point. From here forward, they become somebody else's responsibility. If you want it, take it. They're free for the taking. If they remain beyond today, they will find another home. And uh, so feel free, if you have any interest at all, to take those beautiful poinsettias and give them another home. And uh, we will certainly happily make them available to you. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. For this day you have given us, thank you that we can be gathered together as we are. Once again, we thank you for your word. Thank you that uh, your word is truly, as it is described, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We recognize that as we hide the words of your, of your word in our heart, that it will help us to live the lives that are pleasing to you. In your precious name we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. You are dismissed.